Well, hello and welcome to all of our campuses, those watching here in Ann Arbor, those watching at our Jackson, Michigan campus at the AMC Classic 8, and those watching on YouTube throughout the week. I say it all the time and I mean it. We're one church that meets across multiple locations. So what I love to do is we get started in today's message across all those spaces. Let's welcome our church family to church today. Come on, who's happy to be at church today across all those spaces? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, hey, my name is Jason Tucker, and I'm the lead pastor at North Rock, and I want you to know that I'm, a, I'm just extraordinarily glad that you're here today in week three of a series that we're calling What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. If you're visiting with us, do me a favor today and connect uh, at your campus, no matter what location you're at, even if you're online, fill out a connect card today so that we know that you're here so that we can let you know a little bit about who we are and maybe just answer any questions that you have about this church or, or even just be praying for you if you have a need in your life uh, that you would love us to be praying for. We would love the opportunity to connect with you. So just, you can fill out that connect card in a physical form right there in front of you uh, at your campus. There's a card in front of you if you would fill that out or you can fill it out online at www.northrock.tv and right on our main page, there's a, a button that says welcome card. If you're at a physical location, hang on to that card for a little bit later. We'll use it later on in the service as well. All right, so jumping into week number three of this series called What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. If you missed the first two weeks, I wanna encourage you to go back and check out our YouTube channel because there are some building blocks in those first two weeks that I think are essential to really kind of getting the fullness out of what we're gonna talk about today. And you can always watch our messages online. Um, we, we have our North Rock Church YouTube page, but we've also, in addition to that, uh, got those messages available. We share them on our social media pages as well. So you can always go to our Facebook pages for North Rock Jackson or North Rock Ann Arbor uh, and check those out. North Rock Chelsea as well, coming spring 2020. All right, let's dive in. So we've been saying over these last three weeks that there are times in life that we face decisions that we have absolutely no idea what to do. We've been calling them those square peg, round hole decisions where, you know, obviously if they were moral decisions, we all have a degree of morality, uh, whether it's different or not. We all feel um, that we're, we have a moral compass. And even though all of them might be a little bit different in and how they attack the world, we all use morality to make decisions. Um, and some of those decisions are very easy based on that compass. They're uh, decisions like, should I go rob a bank? And the, the answer to that is probably not gonna turn out well for you. So we know the answers to those, but what about the, what about the uh, decisions in life that are a little more difficult? The things that don't necessarily fit into a, just particularly a moral category, like, should we have kids? Should we not have kids? Should I take the job in another city and move the family to another city? Or should we stay where we're at and, and I should just be content with the job that I have and continue to invest in the company that I'm in? Should I have the surgery? Should I not have the surgery? Life, in my opinion, is full of these kind of decisions where we're faced with things that kind of go beyond just the easy snap decisions. And the reason there's a tension with this is everybody wants to be good at life. We all want to get life kind of by the tail. We want to live it to the fullest. We want to make decisions that are progressing our life, not causing regression uh, or taking steps in the wrong direction. We want to get good at life. But what we found out, I'm sure you found this out about life, uh, just like me, is that being moral doesn't necessarily make you good at life. Now, obviously, morality is important. Having a moral compass is very important. Um, how your morality is guided is, is a big deal. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But morality by itself isn't enough. I've, I've known many people that are very moral, but they're not really that good at life in other areas, like their relationships or, or maybe their decision-making when it comes down to their finances. Moral doesn't necessarily make you good at life. At the same token, smarts don't necessarily make you good at life. I can be incredibly smart, but still absolutely tragic when it comes down to my relationships or, or other areas of my life, Like because not everything works according to 
smarts and at the same time success. A lot of times you would think success is the mark of, of a happy life. Success is the mark of a, you know, a fulfilled life. But why is it that when we achieve success, that it just doesn't always fill the void? It, it doesn't fully fill that thing inside of us. And it doesn't answer every question easily for us. So morality, smarts, and success just are not enough. And that's what we've been saying over the last two weeks in this series is, Wisdom is being good at life. Wisdom is being good at life. Morality, smarts, success, and so much more are a part of this fabric that I believe God has woven into our existence in life. And I think that fabric is called wisdom. And we've been studying, in particular, three books of the Bible that are the wisdom books. That's Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Those books uh, are deemed as the wisdom books in the Bible. Now, obviously, all the books of the Bible have a lot of wisdom that we can, we can learn from. But in particular, the fabric of wisdom is discussed in depth in those three books from a different perspective, all from a, a different outlook in life. And now over the last couple of weeks, we've, we've really been talking a lot about Solomon, the according to the Bible, the second wisest person to ever walk the planet because he asked God for wisdom when he could have asked God for a lot of things. God granted Solomon wisdom. Uh, he was a king in Israel that was revered for his wisdom. People came from all over the world to sit at his feet and listen. And two of the three books of the Bible on wisdom, Solomon penned. He wrote. So it's very interesting to, to uh, kind of dive into um, what Solomon has to say about wisdom. Now, that's what we've, we've been doing over the last two weeks. But now today, I kind of want to play uh, that th the skeptic a little. I want to play the skeptic when it comes down to our decision-making, when it comes down to uh, wisdom itself. Because I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is, okay, if I can find wisdom, if it's there for me to observe, to acquire, if it's, if it's there for me to chase after, whether that's in my Bible or pursuing a relationship with, with Jesus, Absolutely, wisdom is there. But while I'm in pursuit of all those things, what are you calling wise? What are you calling wise? What, what, what kind of choices are you calling wise? What kind of thinking are you calling wise? And in particular, this is a very profound question, especially in the world that we live in today. Because I, I'm sure you've probably observed to some degree, if you turn on the news at night, or, or any kind of media whatsoever. Hey, everybody, the world is really asking this question. Leading up to the next election, as it comes in 2020, when it comes down to the direction of our country, when it comes down to life as we know it, this is a pretty profound question that we all have to ask ourselves. Because if we're all chasing wisdom, but yet in that chase, we have opposing ideas about what is wise, what are you calling wise? Then there must be more to the story. I saw this commercial. It always comes on around Halloween. It's a Geico commercial. And it really kind of alludes to this idea. When, <laughs> what are you calling wisdom, right? Because what do you do? It's, it, it, it's the, the scene is a horror movie, right? And what, do, what does everybody in a horror movie do? They think they're making wise choices. They they're calling their choices wise, but what you learn about a horror movie is everybody in a horror movie is making bad decisions. Check this out. Let's hide in the attic. No, in the basement. Why can't we just get in the running car? Are you crazy? Let's hide behind the chainsaws. <laughs> if you're in a horror movie, you make poor decisions. That's what you do. Shh, I'm being quiet. Breathing on me. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to Geico. It's what you do. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny. Because it really does apply to our lives, you know, in a, in a lot of ways. <laughs> the, the, the scene where, why don't we get in the running car? Like, that would make sense. No, let's go hide by the chainsaws, right? <laughs> I 
so many times in life, we're, we have to ask ourselves this question, especially because of the interpretation that, that wisdom gets. There are a lot of different people that are saying a lot of choices are wise. But yet, we really should be asking ourselves, where, where does that wisdom come from? Where are we getting that wisdom from? How do we really know what's wise? And that's a really important question that James asked, the brother of Jesus, in James 3, 13 and 16. He said, who is wise and understanding among you? In other words, like, I'm hearing a lot of different things that people are calling wisdom. I'm hearing a lot of different things that, whether it's uh, on Fox News or CNN at night, I'm hearing a lot of things that the world around me is calling wisdom. Whether it's some advice I'm getting from some friends about my marriage, uh, I'm hearing a lot of opposing points on what wisdom looks like. And frankly, it's kind of confusing because I don't really know in the end. I, I mean, that sounds wise. It sounds like a good choice, but how do I really know everybody? That's what James is saying. He's saying, who is really wise and understanding among you? Let them show it. Come on, say those words right there with me. Jackson, Michigan on the count of three. One, two, three. Show it. Show me. Right? That scene in Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Show me the money. <laughs> I want to see this. Yeah, I need to see it. James is saying, there's a lot of talk about wisdom. Who among you is wise? Really wise. If it is, let them show it. Let them show it by their good life. By deeds done in humility. James is saying, if you want to know what wisdom is, it's, it's people that can show you in a good life with deeds done in humility that come from, there it is, wisdom. He goes on to say, but if you harbor, in other words, if you've got some stuff on the inside that you're holding on to, if you're harboring bitter envy, in other words, you're, you're seeing other people and there's, there's, there's bitterness in there kind of mixed with a side of, of envy, hmm, maybe, I, maybe I'm a little envious of them, or selfish ambition. If you have any kind of selfish reason for the wisdom that, or for that thing you're calling wisdom in your hearts, if that's harbored in there, if that's living inside of you, do not boast about it or deny the truth. In other words, don't go on boasting and saying, hey, I know what, I know what the wise choice is and deny the truth that these things are inside of you. He goes on to say, such wisdom, watch this, interesting, such wisdom, this kind of wisdom does not come down from heaven. That's not the, that's not the wisdom that God wove into our existence, but it's earthly. It's from the earth. It's originated on earth. It's established on earth. It's based on earth. <laughs> it's unspiritual. And he says it's demonic. I mean, it's literally based on the wisdom of a, a group of angels that fell away from God that got booted out of heaven uh, that, that are not angels anymore, everybody. Like he said, that wisdom is based on, and, and I hate to tell you this, but where'd they get booted to? Earth. <laughs> they got booted here. So he, James is saying the wisdom that comes from the earth is based on, it's that's not spiritual wisdom it's earthly wisdom and it's it's demonic for where you have envy and selfish ambition there you will find disorder and every evil practice james is saying there are two kinds of wisdom and this is really the litmus test for well, what are we calling wise what do i call wisdom when i look at the state of our country when I think of where the world's headed, when I'm making a decision about my, my finances, my relationships, when I'm making decisions about my health, when I'm making decisions about really anything in life, what do I call wisdom? James says, well, hey, careful. There are actually two kinds of wisdom. There's an earthly wisdom and there's a heavenly wisdom. And he said, it's really important that you understand the difference. And I'm gonna try to help you understand uh, that today. He said, there's wisdom from above, heavenly wisdom, and there's wisdom from below, earthly wisdom. Now, uh, this is to help illustrate a little bit because there are a lot of there's a lot of wisdom from below that we are influenced by. Obviously, from the very beginning, 
God established the world. God created the world that we live in and sin broke that perfect bond with God. And as a result of that breaking, God sent Jesus, his son, to die on the cross so that this relationship, this bond, this understanding of heavenly wisdom, of God's way of doing things, could be reestablished because it was broken by sin. And obviously, Jesus on the cross at, at North Rock, we believe wholeheartedly that, uh, without question, that the only reason that we're able to have a relationship with God at all, to get to know God or understand wise living better is simply because of what Jesus did on the cross. Without that, we don't deserve to, to have a relationship with God. We're like God is, is good, everybody. Heavenly wisdom is good. And Jesus is what bridged that gap for us back to God, receiving what he did, dying for our wrongdoing, dying for our lack of wisdom. When we didn't even know him. He died in our place. And, and not only did God do that for us, then he gave us the Bible. He said, hey, here's Jesus, which will bridge this gap. And then here's the Bible so that you can understand more about my way of doing things, my kind of wisdom, how, how I set this up. The problem is, is that we've got, we, that's us right there. That's me. Uh, that's you. We exist below. We exist in a place where the, the, the wisdom of heaven is something that isn't exactly active all around us. That's why Jesus prayed in the most famous prayer ever, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth the same way it is in heaven. I want, I want your will done here like it is in heaven. We need that here. But see, in our lives, we've got a ton of different voices and influences that are giving us wisdom, right? It probably starts with your parents. Some of us had parents that were all about uh, uh, helping us understand the wisdom from above. Some of us had parents that ha didn't want anything to do with that. But we all had the influence of parents or step parents or somebody that stepped in as a parent in our life, right? Teachers. We had teachers and, and they were an influence on our lives. We had education. We went and learned things. That's where the smarts come in. We had screens, right? We, had, we, got, our, we got these cell phones and, 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 and obviously the computer screens and the TV screens. Any kind of screen is, is a way to have wisdom or influence poured into my life. Social media uh, platforms, popular opinion, everybody. Politics, I mean, Lord knows, that's ramping up over the next year here. Um, th there's so many things which are speaking wisdom into our life. And then there's church. Church, this gathering of imperfect people that are doing our best to seek the ways of and find the ways of a perfect God. There is no perfect church on the planet. I know that that might, some of you might be ready to get up and walk out now. Like, hey, I thought this place was perfect. Let me let you off the hook. This is not a perfect church because we're not perfect people. But see, we are in pursuit of a perfect God. We are in pursuit of a wisdom that's perfect. But see, the challenge that we have with all of these influences in our lives is simply this. Uh, we draw a circle around all of them and we treat them all as equal influences. We say, really, all of these things weigh the same thing. They all weigh, you know, I understand there's a God, there's Jesus, there's the Bible, but there's my parents, there's my teachers, my education, my screens, my social media, my popular opinion, my politics, and my imperfect gathering of people <laughs> called my church and, and when we do this, when we draw a circle around it, I'm telling you, in my opinion, I think this is why society is so confused about wisdom, everybody. Because the problem is when, when all of these things are equal, when all the voices are equal that are speaking into our lives, I make my opinion of it all my definition of wisdom. I want you to think about that. When I take all of the voices and influences in my life and I evaluate them all or make them all equal, the problem with doing that is I make me the center of it all. I make me the center of all of this influence so then I just form my own opinions and my own definitions of what's wise. And I believe that's the world that we live in today. We have a lot of people who are defining wisdom. In fact, I would say as a society, 
uh, over the course of history, we've redefined what's wise over and over and over again. We're in pursuit of it. We're hungry for it. But see, the problem is when all of those things are seen as equal, I, I form my own opinions about what wisdom is because I think that this is all about me. I love how C.S. Lewis talks about this. An incredible book. If you're, if you're looking for a book that's very relevant on the current state of the world, C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Men, an extraordinary read. He said this in his book. Uh, he said, it is no use trying to see through first principles. And what he's talking about here is, it, there's no use to try to see through the things that are bigger than you. Like they're bigger than you. These are first principles. These are God made these, created these. And, and what we're doing as a society is we're looking into, we're peering into God's first principles and we're trying to see through them. And we're coming up with our own definitions of wisdom. He said, if you see through everything, if you're looking to see through everything, everything's equal, so I'm gonna see through it all. Look, then everything is transparent. <laughs> everything is see-through. And he said, but a wholly transparent world is an invisible world. In other words, a world where you and I make up our own definitions based on how we see it, that's an invisible world. That's a world full of a lot of people with a lot of different opinions. That's a world full of tension. <laughs> and James goes on to say, what did he say in the scripture? He said, wherever you see selfish ambition and, 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 and bitter envy, you're going to find disorder and evil of all kinds, everybody. That's, that's the world that I believe we live in today. We live in a world where we think everything's transparent. It's how I see it. It's the way I look at it that matters. But a wholly transparent world, it is, it's an invisible world. To see through, to see through all things is the same as not to see at all. Powerful words that I think really, man, they illustrate a truth that, that we see in Proverbs and really throughout the Bible, and that's this. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 16, 25, there's a path before each person, each one of us, that seems right. Like we think this is the right path. I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm after wisdom. It seems right, but it ends in death. We look at things, we look through things. And we treat all of those influences in our lives as equals. And seeing through everything from our opinion, looking at it transparently, what we find out in the end is that's not the way to the life that God promised you and I, the best life. That's not, that was not God's intentions from the first place. So how do we know the difference? If there's two kinds of wisdom and I might have a tendency and you might have a tendency to make things about my opinion or my way of seeing things or, you know, or how I view the world, how do I know the difference between earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom? Well, I think a good illustration is, have you ever seen the life straw? The concept of the life straw is this, is that it, it can take extraordinarily dirty water <laughs> and, and you're, a, you're able to take this straw, life straw, they created this, so that if you're surrounded by dirty water, you can put this straw in and it will make that water purified. It'll clean the water up for you. And I'll never forget when this hit the market. It blew up. Everybody was like, this is gonna, this re is gonna revolutionize the world. Like, think about all the places in the world that have, uh, they don't have clean drinking water. And think about how this is gonna revolutionize that for so many people. Obviously, not just people who love the outdoors, but countries where uh, they just don't have access to clean drinking water. And their drinking water is filled with a lot of things that are very harmful to drink. So obviously you look at this and you go, man, what a brilliant idea. And from the outside looking in, it looks like that's an incredible idea. It's amazing. But what you learn about the life straw is it's actually not made for every circumstance. It's not made for every situation. Because what happened is when they start passing these out, people started going, sweet, I'm going to see how this thing works. And they started going basically dipping this thing in tar and trying to drink the water out of tar. Find the dirtiest, nastiest water source you can find. And, and what they found out is that it actually didn't solve all the problems with clean drinking water. Did it make it better? Absolutely. 
It made it better. It was good. It was an advancement. But what you had to learn is if you just bought the life straw, the life straw didn't get rid of viruses in the water. The life straw didn't get rid of heavy metals in the wire or in, or in, the, in the water. And, and, and obviously that's a problem because there are viruses traveling around in the water. So you've got to get an upgraded version of a life straw. You need a better filter for that water. And I think that's exactly the world that we're living in. We're living in a world that's thirsty for clean drinking water. We're thirsty for wisdom, everybody. In our upcoming election, we're thirsty for wisdom in the world that we live in today. We're thirsty for wisdom in our lives. But sometimes we're settling for something that sounds good, the life straw. It sounds like it's exactly what we need. But listen, we need a better filter than that because it doesn't filter out all the viruses. It doesn't filter out all the heavy metals that are in the water. And, and, and some of those things can be damaging to us if we're not careful. So that's why I love what James has to say. He goes on and says, hey, listen, you need a better filter. You need a good filter for wisdom. You need a foolproof way to know. Yes, 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 yes. See all those yeses in that last column? You need a foolproof way to know. You can drink through this straw. And, and you're going to get clean water. You're going to get the thing that you need. And it's going to be good for you. James says this. He starts off by saying, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. It's pure. Heaven's wisdom is pure. What do you, what do you mean by that, Jason? Well, like, if I say, give me cranberry juice, cranberry juice comes in a lot of different forms, right? Like, I, I could drink a Capri Sun it tells me it has cranberries in it. But there, like, a Capri Sun is like minimal juice and mostly other things, right? <laughs> so I can upgrade from a Capri Sun and I can go say, well, I'm going after the Ocean Spray cranberry juice. But if you look and read the label close on, on an Ocean Spray cranberry juice, it doesn't say 100% cranberry juice. It says 100% juice. So on, on that bottle, it's saying you're getting all juice. But in the fine print, it says... It's actually a mix of different juices that we mix with cranberry juice to give you the juice, right? No, friends, if you want cranberry juice and you want 100% cranberry juice, the only way you're going to get it is from cranberries, everybody. <laughs> you, you can only get 100% cranberry juice from cranberries. You can only get 100% orange juice from oranges. You can't add other juice to it. The wisdom from heaven is pure. It's purely from God. It's not kind of from God and kind of from us. Like, that's not how this works. James says you can't mix the two. You can't mix heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom and expect you're getting pure wisdom. It doesn't work that way. The purest form of wisdom comes from God alone. And we see it in Proverbs from the pen of Solomon. He says, all a person's ways, all of our ways, they seem pure to us. They seem right. But motives are weighed by the Lord. Our ways seem pure when it comes down to our definition of wisdom. But God himself is the only one where pure wisdom comes from. You can't get 100% pure cranberry juice from any other thing than purely cranberries. And so you can't get 100% of God's wisdom from any other place than the purest form from God himself. The second thing is, Solomon's, or, uh, James says, is he says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, then it's peace-loving. Apply this to your life, everybody, in every situation. Am I purely chasing after God? Okay, am I purely chasing God's wisdom? Am I... Is, is the wisdom now that I'm chasing, once I've said, okay, I believe I know what God wants me to do, is it peace-loving? Is, is it peace-loving? Are you in love with making peace? I mean, I think about this with regards to the world that we live in today and all the opposing opinions on wisdom. I think about all the arguments that start and all the, all the bitterness that's out there and all the rage around what's the right direction or the wrong direction for our country, what's the right direction or the wrong direction morally in our lives. 
then I think, well, if the wisdom from heaven is pure, then it purely comes from God. But then second, it's peace loving, which really, I think you could sum it up this way. Solomon said in Proverbs 23, he said, any fool can start an argument, but the honorable thing to do is to stay out of them. Say what? <laughs> any fool can start arguments, but the honorable thing to do is to stay out of them. Is the wisdom that you and I believe that we're getting in life, is it peace loving? Are we loving making peace? Is that part of it? Or do we feel like uh, it, that it's something different? Like when it comes down to how I deal with my relationships, particularly my marriage. If, if I believe that, that, I, that I've gotten some wisdom and I've had many people over the years tell me that, you know, man, I really believe that, Jason, that I've heard from God on this. And, uh, you know, God told me that I, need, I'm go, I'm, I should leave my wife. And I'm like, uh, okay, well, <laughs> hang on a second. Let, let's run it through the filter. Let's, and, and, and maybe the life straw that you're drinking through, you got to be careful because that might be letting in some viruses. Let's upgrade our life straw. And let's really get down to the nitty gritty. What's the, what's the essence? What's the filter for wisdom? First off, is, is it pure? Is it pure? Are you back to saying, I'm not, this wisdom that I'm, I'm getting is from, from God alone. It's the cranberries, everybody. Like I'm, I'm going to God on this wisdom. God is, uh, and I see it revealed not just through the life of Jesus, but through God's word. Because we can say it's from God, but if it doesn't line up with God's word or it doesn't look like Jesus, it's not pure. But then in addition to that, is it peace loving? Is it striving for a peaceful resolution? Because that's wisdom from heaven. The next thing, Sol or the next thing James says is, is it considerate? But the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, and considerate. What does that mean? Well, I would say probably in, in one word, considerate is just saying, is the wisdom that I'm, I'm, I got right now, is it you before me? Is it others focused? Am I considering other people? Solomon says, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. The word poor in this particular translation doesn't just mean those that are less fortunate in life. Those, it, it's more referencing those who have needs around you. Is the decision that you're making or the wisdom that you're calling wisdom, is it thinking about the needs of the people around you? Is it pure? Does it come from the purest place? Is it, is it pursuing a peaceful resolution? Is it others focused? Is it focused on the needs of other people, not just my own needs? I'm not the center of this. Man, James, this is good. <laughs> he goes on to say it's also submissive. The wisdom from heaven is submissive. This word has taken a bad rap in our society today, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first off pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive. What, what does that mean, submissive? Well, I'll, I'll show it to you in scripture. Proverbs 16, 19, better is it to be of a humble spirit, humility, with the meek than to divide the spoil with the proud. Meek isn't weak, everybody. That's not what it is. Meek is submissive. And what I mean by submissive is simply this. I've shown you this chart before. Meek is choosing, I want to live God's way on God's power. It's saying, I want to submit my way of doing things to God's way. I, I don't want my way because I know my way is not pure. <laughs> I know my way is drinking through a straw that's not getting all the viruses out of this water. I need an upgrade. I need the purest form, the peace-loving form. I need the considerate form. I need the submissive form. What does that mean? Well, there, there are really four different ways you can live your life. You can do it your way on your power, and I would call that the empty life. You're going to strive to try to make a life and, and do it on your own power and you're going to find out that that leaves you feeling empty. My way on God's power, a lot of people say, God, I want my way and I want you to bless it. And that's the unfulfilled life because, you know, that's, that's not God's way of doing things. He's not going to just bless our plan for our marriage. He's not just going to bless our plan for, for the things that we want. No, that's not wisdom. 
How about God's way on my power? I think a lot of people live this way. It's the frustrated life. We're doing what God wants us to do. I'm, I'm being considerate. I mean, I'm being submissive. I'm, I'm being peace loving, but I'm trying to do it on my own power. I'm not tapping into the power that God has for my life. And that's a frustrating way to live life. But I believe James, when he's encouraging us to be submissive or the wisdom is submissive, he's saying it's, that's just God's way on God's power. Submissive is saying, I don't have enough power to live this out. And I don't right, really know the right way to live this out. And that's the fulfilled life. He goes on to say, wisdom, is all, he, wisdom from heaven is also full of mercy. Come on, let this sink in today. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, it's peace-loving, it's considerate, it's submissive, it's full of mercy and good fruit. There are good things that are coming from just the fullness of mercy. What's mercy? Not giving someone what they deserve? That's what heaven's wisdom looks like. I don't know if you've seen this story or not, but it's been floating around on social media for some time now for a couple of weeks. And it's a story out of Dallas where uh, an, an off-duty uh, police officer, a former police officer, came home to her apartment one night and thought that she was walking in to her own apartment, but by accident walked into the apartment of another person. A man named Botham, and, and Botham was sitting on the couch in his own apartment who the police officer thought was hers by accident, eating a bowl of cereal. And she got startled that there was an intruder in her house and she pulled out a gun and shot twice. One of those bullets struck both of them in the chest and killed him. She went on trial and, and obviously all the emotions that go along with this, with the family and man, could you imagine just what, a, what an, incredible, an incredibly tragic situation and if you just want to see what being full of mercy looks like when i saw this clip i just i couldn't believe it uh, my heart was just overwhelmed to think that somebody could experience that in particular it was his brother that day that was on the stand that after the, the verdict had been read that this woman was going to go to jail and she was going to spend time in jail for the crime that she had committed. This was the response of the brother of the victim. Check this out. I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's, what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes.
that says take revenge, in a world that says give it back, in a world that demands for justice, that's just a powerful expression of what wisdom from heaven looks like. And here again, we see it in scripture that Proverbs 11, 7 says, a merciful person, they help themselves, but a cruel person hurts themselves. Showing mercy, being full of mercy, giving what's not deserved. That's the heart of heaven, everybody. That's the message of the cross, what Jesus did for us. <laughs> Powerful words from James when you think about it, because he goes on to say, not only is it all those things, wisdom from heaven is impartial. It's impartial. It, it, it's not about taking sides. It's not about, uh, you know, like who's right and who's wrong. It's about God's wisdom being unequaled. There is no equal to God's wisdom. And, and uh, the impartial nature of, uh, of right and wrong, James just says, this is what wisdom looks like. It, it's impartial. It's, it's just seeing this from a totally different perspective. And uh, Proverbs 16, 11 says, honest scales and balances belong to the Lord. In, in other words, it's God that weighs all this out. We can't handle weighing it all out. We don't have enough knowledge. We don't have enough understanding and we never will to weigh this all out. It's God that weighs it all out. All the weights in the bag are of his making. Wisdom from heaven is, it's impartial. It's, it's, it's a balanced scale knowing that <laughs> I, I'm just... I'm not trying to find myself on either side of an argument. I'm trying to find myself in the wisdom that's pure, in the wisdom that's peace-loving, in the wisdom that's considerate, in the wisdom that, that is, it's, it's chasing after mercy. It's full of mercy. It's impartial. But finally, it's sincere. It's real. It's not fake. It's not phony. It's, it's not something that you can fabricate or make up. No, our, our filter for wisdom is very clear. The wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and it's sincere. Solomon would, would say that this way. He would say, if you search for good, you'll find favor with God. But if you search for evil, it'll find you. Wisdom from heaven is sincere and so when, when we think about all of these things in our in our desire to find true wisdom church i think it's important to understand especially in the world that we live in today that this is our filter for wisdom that comes from above this is the the upgraded version of the life water filter for you and i that we can see it we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt what does wisdom look like in my decisions for for my future? What does wisdom look like in my decisions for my relationships? What does wisdom look like for me as a Christ follower in this world around me that is so thirsty for clean drinking water? True wisdom, the wisdom that God intended is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, impartial, and sincere, which I believe leads us to really kind of where I want to leave off today is where will I get my wisdom from? In my life, from my decisions, for every day that I have the opportunity to be alive, where will I get my wisdom from? What filter will I be running my wisdom through? How will I know if the choices I'm making in life are the choices that God, want me, God wants me to make are the choices that wisdom is leading me to make. Where will I get my wisdom when I don't know what to do? Will you bow your heads with me today as we close out? God, thank you for this truth. Thank you for your word today. 
I pray for everybody here as, as we're all seeking wisdom in our life, as we're all really thirsty for the pure drinking water of wisdom, that God, you would help us find it, that you would redefine wisdom for us in a world that is so thirsty uh, for it, God, in a world that is so confused and conflicted, let our lives shine. Let our lives shine to be something different as you have designed it to be. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.